So we're here with Dr. Steve Keen in Toronto. It's the summer of 2012. Where are we, Steve? Uh, it's called the Fields Institute, and this is a specialist mathematical research center which uh, gets funded by a, a, a range of institutions that has about $5 million a year that it puts towards uh, giving assistance from mathematicians to a whole range of different areas. So it's a place for mathematical conferences. It's also a place where, um, say, people working who might be engineers come and work with a mathematician to solve a type of problem they haven't got the mathematics to do and so on. And uh, yeah, I got to, uh, the reason I'm here is because uh, in a very serendipitous way, the Fields Institute found about, about my work on modeling financial instability. So I'm now working with some of the mathematicians here to improve uh, the techniques that I use and to further analyze the models that I've built. So they're helping you out or you're helping them out? Both. Uh, it's, it's an intriguing story and the way it begins is that um, the Fields Institute, because it's a, a specialist applied mathematics center, uh, helps out engineers, physicists, you know, the whole range of different areas take place here, and economists. And so for the last 20 years or so, it's been a place where people have developed financial economics, mathematical financial economics. Um, and so, so this is not neoclassical economics? Yeah, so. yeah. Well, it is. Be, be, well, they didn't know it was neoclassical economics. They knew it was economics. Okay. Okay. This is the thing. Be, be people who aren't inside the profession don't realize that it's divided. So far as they see, there's the economists out there. So their attitude was that, uh, well, the economists developed all these models like the efficient markets hypothesis, capital asset pricing model, uh, um, Black-Scholes options pricing, et cetera, et cetera. They assume equilibrium, which is unusual so far as mathematicians go, that you don't you normally have a dynamic system which uh, you know, you've got to decide whether the equilibrium either exists or is stable before you do anything about it, but all the models have equilibrium. But, these are the professionals, they must know, you know. So the mathematician would help them improve the, the caliber of the mathematics and analyze the dynamics and add various the elements in there. They then had a seminar which was started being planned in 2005, but finally took place in 2008. So a whole bunch of people who got, you know, leading reputations in financial economics, mathematical economics, mathematical finance, were here with the mathematicians and were completely caught by surprise by the financial crisis, didn't have a clue as to why it had happened, and we, we, the mathematicians realized, but we thought you guys were the experts. So then um, there was a, there's a, coming out of the center, one of the many institutions that have spun off over time where they try to be an incubator for new businesses as well, uh, is a, what's it's called? I think it's called analysis or some risk analysis company, which is the world leading producer of software for risk analysis in banks. And the managing director of that was giving a speech here. And the, one of the mathematicians that said, well, you know, um, obviously we're in a cycle and, and clearly economic theory presumes equilibrium. So if I want to learn about uh, cycles, what economist should I read? And he said, read Kindleberger. So the mathematician got out Kindleberger and the very first thing Kindleberger spoke about was Hyman Minsky. That was the intellectual framework Kindleberger uses for manias, panics, and crashes. And you know, the mathematician read it and thought, this is a pretty compelling explanation of where we are. Right, so Minsky, that's the work that you That I'm doing, yeah. Right? yeah. So Kindleberger has a, a, a book which is a historian's view of, of manias, panics, and crashes, okay. and so on. And he uses... That's the title, do you know? That's the title. Manias, panics, and crises, um, and he uses Minsky's ideas as an organizing framework for talking about that. So, so you've if got. If a person read that book, would they have been seeing this 2008 thing coming? Kind of. Or? They'd certainly have a better idea that it could happen. But certainly, the, if you wanted to really understand it than Minsky, you go to the original rather than. So, but Kindleberger used Minsky's ideas as an organizing framework, and so the mathematician reads the first few chapters, talks about Minsky, compellingly. Um, provocative idea. He knows Kindleberger is referred to by the mainstream. Even Brad DeLong now talks about Kindleberger. I'll come out of that one later. Um, so mainstream, uh, solid analysis, convincing. There must be much, lots of mathematical models out there of Minsky. It's obviously mainstream. So he goes and takes a look in the, in the Econ Lit, which is the online database that academic economists have for articles. Search for model Minsky model. He didn't only find one. <laughs> There were a couple of others, um, but he just found me. That was it. And he was quite stunned because he thought, what's going on here? This is a compelling argument. The only uh, 
sensible, in terms of the level of complexity, mathematical model is by one guy. So he then corresponds with me and then starts wondering what I, uh, he then now, published. Who are we talking about this corresponding? Matthias Griselli, who's one of the, he's the deputy director here. Oh, okay. okay. So he then. He's um, a mathematician then? He's a, math, he's, he's a professor of mathematics from McMaster University. That's in Canada. In the Canada, Ontario. yeah, in, in uh, Hamilton. So, uh, um, so he, having read it, he, and he used my model. He, he then took, um, you know, in, a, in the sense, in the, in the model I described, the dynamics of the model and, and um, the two states it could lead to, uh, either a financially stable system where there's an equilibrium reached in terms of debt, uh, worker share, wage, uh, debt, income distribution, and employment will reach equilibrium, or under some initial conditions, you could go to infinite debt, uh, zero employment and zero wages, which of course is a Great Depression. And then, you know, then with, because there's no, in my model, I didn't have any bankruptcy. There was no way out. Once the debt spiral started, that was it. Right. So he then mathematically analyzed the stability properties, et cetera, et cetera, published a paper on it, and then approached me at that stage. And by this, this point, Having enjoyed Did you read the paper and review it, or oh, just, just let me know it's being published. Okay. okay. So then he started looking at other things I'd written and got debunking economics. Your book. My book. And then he's looking through it, and of course I wrote it for a, a to a, to un, to explain to non-mathematical readers the numerous mathematical critiques that have been done of mainstream economics. Quite a few of them unintentionally own goals and soccer parlance by neoclassical economists. So he read through the stuff and he's got progressively, you're kidding, you know, their eyes widening and thinking economics is not like chemical engineering or quantum mechanics or anything else like that. It's obviously riven with his visions and huge amounts of what we thought were well-founded principles simply haven't been thought through properly. So he then suggests we start collaborating and that's why I'm now on the Fields Institute. And you've been here for three or four weeks now? Or? Yeah, about a month. I arrived on June 1st and I'll be leaving on uh, Friday, July 6th. So. Are you skipping teaching classes this term? Oh, well, it's a, we're at, our, our university uh, operates on a southern hemisphere cycle, so uh, we have our minor break between semesters. You guys have your major break um, now. We have our minor break now. So it gave me six weeks. So I, I head off from here to Washington. I'll be doing an interview on the Capital Account Show, my, my favourite shows. Is that for which networks? Though? It's on Russia Today. Russia today. Yeah, they've got Max Russia. Kaiser and, uh, and uh, Capital Account. And you've been on that two or three times? Yeah, probably? oh yeah, yeah. Well, half a dozen or so. Yeah, okay. very good show. And then uh, off to New York, meeting some hedge fund people there, which should be intriguing. Is that the same hedge fund you met last year? No, I've still got to, I'm trying to find the email of the people who actually helped me out there because they gave me a grant that let me hire a, uh, an assistant for this year. Uh, but the company's folded. So uh, the hedge fund industry, I think, is now on a downward trajectory because... Now, what is a hedge fund, anyway? Well, it, it's, a, it's an abused it's word. That, you know, yeah. I don't invest, so I'm not really sure what it is. Yeah, I know. Hedge implies, you know, saying, look, oh, um, sun shining outside, but you never know. I'll take an umbrella in case it rains. Okay. That's a classic hedge, okay, a genuine what we mean by hedge, hedging your bets. You think it's going to be sunny, but it might rain, so you take an Planning umbrella. for low probability events. Exactly, okay. Now, the way that what they do with the hedge is they say, we think, for example, this share is going to tank, absolutely collapse, okay? So we, we can, if, we, if we buy a future to, to sell it to somebody at its, at its price range it's currently at. So you think something's going to tank, so yeah. Best might, Buy is going to tank. Huh? Pardon? Best Buy is going to tank yeah. because they sell electronics and DVDs and now you can get all that online. Yeah, that's and right. And the other stores are very closed. Yep. The other so you um, think it's going electronic go, stores. You, and people, people don't realize this and you think something's going to happen soon. Okay? So it's got to be a timing issue. You think it's shares 50, it's going to go to 10, we reckon. Uh, you can now buy a, a, a put option to sell it to somebody for $30, really almost for nothing. Okay? So you then hope to get the right to sell it for thirty dollars, when it's selling for ten, and you make a huge profit there. But just in case you're wrong, you also buy some physical shares, or you buy another option. So you whether you collar. So when do you win? Well, you you win because if, if, you, you if don't you, win if it stays the same yeah, price. Yeah, yeah. You win, you win if it varies. You have a, yeah. A, a set investment. Right? Yeah. Okay. So what what can then happen is you what you've done is you 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 are trying you'll do a lot of investments like that or speculations, gambles. Right. And they think you want to be right 51% of the time. 
Okay? So you, you don't make back your money. Yeah, you know, enormous amounts of money are bet. Half the t almost half the time you lose, slightly more than half the time you win, you make a fortune. That's, that's the idea behind it. But it's not really what we mean by hedging in the real world. It's abuse of language, as is so typical in economics and finance. Um, but that overall, the reason I, I believe that so strategy... So the way that hmm? really a hedge fund works is it's betting that some shares are going to fall in price. Or up, either way. Or go up. It doesn't, it's just variability. So and you're going to vary, and based on that, you're yeah. going to make money yeah. for the yeah. fund. Yeah, yeah. But the other uh, element of it has been that if you look at the what people normally think of about variation, and this is uh, one thing that has led us astray so badly, is the old bell curve, you know, the normal distribution. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you plot the normal distribution for heights, body weights, right. IQs, sure. et cetera, et cetera, uh, then the data you'll find fits through it pretty well. Really now, what it, what it means is that it has, after five or de standard deviations above or below the mean. You're like 99.9% of the data. Well, virtually there's nothing on the other side. Right. You, you, you've got the entire range there. But with a chaotic distribution, you can get 10 and 20 sigma events, as they call it. Okay. Which can, you, know, you, you can think that the normal variation of the stock market is, say, up and down 1% on a daily basis. That's right. pretty much the standard deviation of the stock market. Well, if it was normal data, you would then say nothing bigger than plus 5 or minus 5 will ever happen. Now, it's obvious. Well, it could happen, but the probability is just... So well, yeah, well, probability ends up being once every two and a half thousand years. Right, okay. Right, okay. Okay. Well, it ends up being about much one. More frequent than that. Yeah. Well, we've we've had we've had plus we've had a minus twenty event uh, back in October '87, a minus ten event in 1929, and hundreds of events outside that five sigma range. So, so that you're saying the motion of the stock markets is not a normal. Not market. normal at all. But the thing is, it's also that that's, people normally focus on what's called the fat tails, the fact that there's many more events in the extremes than a normal distribution would give you. But where hedge funds have made their money, potentially, is that just as there's more events in the tail, there's also more events around the mean than out of a normal distribution. So if you just get that tiny bit of volatility there and ride that while the market's going... So you going, bet on stability on a stock also. Not so much stability. It's, it's variability around the mean where, there's, where it's, it tends to be closer. Uh, and while the market's moving up, then you get that event. When it starts going down, you get those events. So hedge funds have actually exploited the fact that the distribution is narrower than the standard deviation on the way up. But now the reason, they could, the reason it was going up was because rising levels of debt were being used to gamble on stock markets prices. And the whole rising debt level was actually what was pushing up those asset values, both housing and property and all the derivative instruments and so on. Now that you're getting a deleveraging process, that whole narrow event, things are going to happen around here, has become events out here instead. And all those hedge funds are made money on the way up are being wiped out on the way down. So um, it's not amazing that that particular fund went, unfortunately, because we just so survived that. So that's invited you to come talk? Oh, there's quite a few. I mean, people are hoping to make money out of my analysis. It's, you know, there's a, there's a. And do they appreciate your analysis financially with the role? Well, that has, that hasn't happened yet, and I'm not going to do it for consultancy. I'm, I, uh, so I'm you're not. Doing it for free, really? No, I've, I've done it done it for free for a long time. But if I'm going to, what I prefer to say, look, I, I'm willing to, you know, be in, in, as an advisor on occasions, in an informal way. But I'm not going to be a hired gun, and I'm not going to, um, you know, work for contract and so on. Why not? Uh, a, because I'm trying to do pure research. I'm trying to actually build overall models. And I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it so that I get the time to do the research that I want to do. So I'm happy to make a decent living out of it, obviously. But um, I'm not doing this as a way of making my fortune. And if I actually started doing that and being, you know, spending time doing that, then I couldn't do the time building the mathematical models of financial instability that I actually want to build.